Nicholas Wilton here, and I'm with Mitch Albala, uh, Seattle-based uh, landscape figured, landscape painter and uh, teacher uh, based out of Seattle. Um, Mitch has been painting and teaching for, I don't know, 20, 30 years now. Yeah. Um, it's so exciting uh, to meet a fellow teacher as well as someone so far along. Um, I can't wait to dive into, uh, you know, our approaches are kind of similar and, and our work's very different, but, uh, you know, it's a lot of the same thinking. So listen, thanks so much for being here. I'm really, uh, really stoked you, you were able to do this. Um, so uh, Mitch, let's just uh, dive in here a little bit on your um, background. You know, you've been, were you, you know, you said you sort of started 25 years ago, but were you in a different field entirely? Uh, well, no, I, I actually went to um, art school. I uh, studied painting at, at the City University of New York. I got some really good traditional background there. And when I graduated, I, I continued to paint like right through to the present day. But of course, at that time, I was what, 21, 22, I did other things. Uh, graphics I did, uh, design, and I also had a, you know, like a 10 year career as, as believe it or not, looking at my work now as a technical illustrator doing, doing illustration. Oh, no kidding. Jeez. Yeah. Magazines like popular science and things like that. Uh -huh. And then when I came to Seattle in 91, things started to progressively, uh, ramp up more. Um, I started teaching at Gage Academy and, um, and then just kept, you know, my, my whole career since college has basically been kind of like a, a slow growth upward. I always did it and I always pursued what I loved, you know, then came like, uh, came, uh, exhibitions and, uh, and teaching and eventually writing a book 10 years ago. It all just gradually built, but it wasn't like I graduated college and started showing in top tier galleries and was a success. Yeah. Like I had like, like a lot of artists, I had to do other things and still continue to do some other things to help uh, pay the bills. Sure. Yeah. And now, and, and your work is this, I mean, it's landscape, it's color, it's, it's pattern. You know, it, yeah. How, um, do you, how do you how do you phrase it for well, you? Well, I, I used to playfully. Uh, I had it on my website for a while, and I, I took it down because I thought it would confuse people. But I, I used to playfully refer to it as abstract impressionism um, because it had this color component, very much attuned to conveying to the viewer the sensation of actual light and glowingness. And, and yet it was very abstract, and, and in that way, it was nothing like um, Impressionism. But that, uh, that description aside, um, it's always had its roots in abstraction. You know, uh, a lot of times people will look at my work and they say, ooh, nice, well, what is it? And I, and I say, and almost always I say, well, what do you think it is? I don't tell them, and then they, they sort of think about it for, 10, 15, 30 seconds, and they go, well, it kind of looks like a cloud. And I said, yeah. Or they say it kind of looks like whatever it is, a waterfall. And they say, yeah. You know, or maybe is that a tree there? And I go, yeah. And it's yeah. like, and whether they mistake it for water or a cloud makes no difference to me because they're being engaged. They're having, they're being pulled in and they have to think about it. Yeah, I, I love, I love that. And, you know, I, I fantasize if I could do what you do, it would definitely be, well, it's, it, it would be sort of like bordering on the abstract more, you know, like this idea that it's not, not the waterfall, it's the feeling of the waterfall that you want right. to get. Yeah, one of the things that I, 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 uh, I talk about in my artist statement um, is that, um, you know, my paintings are about, let's say, uh, like the painting back here, you can see it's a, it's a cloud and it's a little... Uh, right river or something and um and yeah that's what it's about on one level but that's only one to me the most minor level it's about color it's about light it's about movement so um so i use this a word this word in my uh, it's not a very sophisticated word but in my in my teaching when i when i ask students well what's your work about what's your painting about um and they and then i tell them you're not allowed to give me nouns you can only give me adjectives or verbs. So, you know, that it has to be, well, it's about the brilliance of the light, or it's about the movement of that river, 
or it's about the abstract quality of the patterns of the of the puddles in front of the on the grass or whatever and then they're starting once they start thinking in adjectives and adverbs adjectives and verbs rather once they wow. start that, then they're getting into the language of painting because you know the painting behind you is a good example and, and, and it's fun to compare the work you do and the work i do because even though they're very different on one level only on the the objective level are they different but on the subjective level of well, what's it about? It's about pattern. It's about shape. It's about movement. I mean, to me, all painting is about that. And the literal subject is in many ways, the least interesting thing. I don't want to get too, when I do get too hung yeah. up on the literal subject, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not happy with it. We all know Andrew Wyeth and I was writing an article about simplified shapes and I took a quote of his, they were asking about his, his work. And he says, well, the trouble with my work is the subject matter there's too much of it. And here's, yes. here's like perhaps the greatest representational painter of the, of the 20th century. And he's talking about going overboard with the subject matter. And I, I could really um, r relate to that. Uh, another thing that I often um, think about um, is, uh, and I, somebody, somebody was looking at my work and they, they, put, they put it into these words and I really liked it. It kind of summed it up and is um, like, I don't, like they show, they looked at one painting and they said, this kind of tells me everything I need to know. Like it's all there for me. Then they looked at this painting and they said, you know, that one is asking me to do a little bit of work. It's asking me to kind of connect the dots. And, and I thought about that and I said, you know, I never framed it that way, but that's actually what I would really prefer to do is to kind of take the viewer in into the painting and have a little bit of a, a journey, if I tell them everything they need to know by delineating every little dot and dash or explaining it too much, like over explaining something. And I, I, yeah, I yeah. paintings to hover on the realm there where the, they're kind of pulled into it. And I think if anybody has kind of a, a positive response to my paintings, I think it's probably because of that. One of the challenges that uh, a lot of artists have that I'm, I'm, I struggle to try to explain this, and I think this is right up your alley, is this idea of of thinking of realistic things if you're interested in painting those and understanding whether you're painting abstractly or realistically that it's all basically the principles, it's all abstract. And you think about, you know, you're working realistically, but your work, you're really focused on abstraction, right? And I just wondered how you frame it and how you teach people to do that. Because the tyranny of the photograph, you know, like, do I paint all of it, or how, how do you think? I know you talk okay. about big masses and everything. Yeah, let me talk. I'll talk first about the abstraction, then I'll talk yeah. about the, the problems with the photograph. Um, what I what I love to say about abstraction, um, and again, it's it's great that you see my little representational things behind me, and then your abstract thing behind. Yeah. Me, it's a good. It's a good example. Good abstract painting will have every element of color and design going on that a totally hyper-realistic painting will have. The only difference is that with the abstract painting, the subject is less identifiable. So a painting will gradually become more abstract as we lose our association to the representational cues. So your painting back there is about forward and back. It's about movement. It's about color. And the, a, a good abstract painting will be about those things. But um, a good representational painting will also be about those things. That's really the difference. But I think what happens sometimes um, is with people, if they don't have a certain kind of training in the beginning, they think that um, abstraction is just a kind of an anything goes license. Yes. And, and, and any, an abst a good abstraction is not just an anything goes proposition. It's, it's smart color, it's smart design, it's smart paint handling, it's all that stuff. It just doesn't have you know, a recognizable subject. That's really the biggest message I would, I would put out there. I, I love that because you know, and this is one of the things that I, I try to give people the underlying principles in all this so they can then, they can go abstract or semi-abstract or super realistic, but 
all of the important ingredients need to be in both. And, and I think you're right. I think people think, oh, well, abstract is just, I don't need to know about a lot of these things because it's abstract, it's totally crazy. And it's like, well, yeah, you can throw paint around, but you need to have the principles and the fundamental information, just like someone who paints a realistic boat scene, you know, it's all the same. Yeah, I mean, I, you can look at an abstract, at least I can and you can look at an abstract painting and know instantly whether it's, it's, it's good abstract work or not. Um, instantly, yes. Yeah, yes. it has, it has a, a, a sort of an integrity to it that's um, undeniable. Like I, I, I look at lots of work um, and I, I see work that I look at that I just, I just don't like for whatever reason. And then I see work that that's really good. I say, I'm, that's awesome. It's not my thing, but that artist really yes. knows what they're doing. Yes, so, yes. You, when, you, when you just, when you think about aesthetics and what makes a painting tick, then there's a lot of, a lot of kinds of painting that uh, really you can just see as being in, in, incredibly wonderful. Um, it's not all about, I mean, I'm a representational painter, but I can freely say it's not all about representation, obviously. I've been doing some writing about art and I'm saying, you know, you have to remember, it's a painting. Yeah. The painting. Um, and, and that's something I need to remind myself every time I'm getting too hung up in, you know, fussing with details or losing my relationship to the paint and, and like, it, yeah. it's all, it all matters. It all matters. And this is what, th that's one of the hardest things to, uh, to teach, by the way, is, is, is that connection to the paint because so much of it has to do with developing um, good hand skills. And that takes many, many years. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, um, you do use photo reference your, your, yes. for your landscape. Can you talk a little bit about how you don't let that photograph, you know, you're not right. copying the photograph and yeah, maybe it's a, it's a, some tips to artists so they can learn how to do yes. this too. Because that's where I look at a lot of landscape pictures and I can just see they're copying photographs, you know. Right. So copying photographs, in this day and age, I mean, there are some purists who will say, oh, no, no, we only paint outside. And I know some amazing painters who do that. Um, now I work, I paint outside and when I paint outside that I bring it home and that's it. It was done outside. The stuff I do in the studio, um, is much more developed that they're not scenes that I would necessarily find just right out the window or at, at my location. I have to think about the abstraction and how I'm going to alter the color. So I do work from photos and like many landscape painters today, I rely on them fairly, fairly strongly. But the problem is that, as you said, that what, what a lot of novices do if they're working from photographs is one is that they may not have experience outside painting. Even if you don't do great painting outside, there's something to be gained by looking at those colors and saying, well, how do I translate those colors yeah. into paint? Um, and if you don't have that experience, you're kind of going to be at a bit of a handicap because it's, that's sort of where you learn the translation. Okay. So that's important. And then you go to the photograph and what a lot of people do is they just, like you say, they just copy the photograph. And I think that's like one of the worst things that you can do in painting. And um, because what happens is when you, if you, if you're just strictly copying the painting out the window, you're not even, you might as well just, print out the photo and hang that, it's going to do a better job. Um, you have to bring something to the, to the painting that's not photographic, that's decidedly your own interpretation. So the way I do that is, um, one is, is really going after the composition, really altering it as needed. None of my, I could show you dozens of paintings where here's the whole scene, you know, from east to west, and I'm just doing this little portion. And that's how I extract um, a little bit of abstraction. So I, 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 I sort of drill down deeply, um, tease apart the composition until I find a collection of shapes that maybe teeter on the edge of abstraction. So that, that takes care of the composition. And then what I do with the color um, is very interesting as well. I, I, I actually, I can fairly say I never just take a photograph you know, print it out or look at it on screen and just paint from it. That's going to get me into yeah. trouble. It's going to have me reproducing photographic color. So I do one of two things. I either um, take the photo 
in Photoshop, which, which I can handle, and I alter the colors around. I, I lighten them, I darken them, I, I shift the entire color scheme over to wow. the blue side or the green side, whatever I want, until I come up with something that's mine. Then I might print that out and refer to that for the color. That's one, that's one thing I do. The other thing that I do is I sometimes just find an interesting color scheme um, that maybe I saw it in another painting or I saw, I saw it in another photo. And then I try to um, diagnose what are those colors. And, and then I create a little set of, like a little color study using those colors. And then I try to apply those colors to my painting. And it, it almost always works. So, so there's the color piece, but the design piece, what criteria do you use? Like, you know, how would, how would someone, how, you know, what criteria do you use to, to, to make an energetic or a really a compelling uh, composition? Well, there's lots, lots of answers to that question. Um, well, there, there are these, um, I don't know if you call them principles, I call them guidelines, just things I always think about. Um, you know, a big thing I think about is, is movement. You know, oh. how does my eye um, move around, move around the painting? I don't just want, you know, that we have these rectangular frames we call our paintings and the rectangular frame has a lot of horizontal energy, has a lot of vertical energy. And I, I need, I want movement to take your eye around the painting. Yeah, and yeah. Most importantly, into the painting. Uh -huh. So, you know, um, so I think about that, I, I'm almost always, like, I don't want an overabundance of horizontals and verticals, and there are a lot of horizontals and verticals in nature, so I look to insert some diagonals, um, and uh, to have your eye carried around the painting. Um, another thing that we, we think about when we do composition is um, intervals, uh, I like to call it pacing and spacing. Um, like, like I'm not going to line up, um, you know, four trees like that. I'm going to have uneven intervals in between them makes the composition more interesting. So if there's something really big over here. Oh, that's cool. Small over yeah. there. If, 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 um, you know, like on, on the frame here, there's about equal space um, between my ears and the edge of the frame. But that's in a painting. That's not something I, I would want to do. I would want to have you know, off to the side. So unequal, unequal uh, intervals, un unequal relationships between the objects. We think about the amount of dark versus the amount of light. We don't want that to be equal. Um, it's, there's a lot yeah, of- Creating that variety and those makes it more interesting. And you know, Absolutely. it's funny you mentioned the, the video frame because, you know, I shoot so much video and, uh, you know, it, it took us a while to realize that, you know, these videos look a lot better, especially if I'm demonstrating, if I'm off, like I'm on one third of it and two thirds, you know, instead yeah. of just putting myself right in the middle, just right. being off, it just makes it like way better. Uh, yeah, so it it's all and this, that. This is like, um, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's science that proves this, but you know, the eye is, is much more engaged when, I mean, just the vision that just came to mind is like a little pinball. It's sort of bouncing around and hitting things. And um, it might even shoot out that way, but then it comes back. And I think composition um, is, uh, at least in my teaching, um, is probably the most least thought about aspect of our practice. I mean, people think a lot about the color. They think about a lot right. about, oh, yeah. about how they're drawing it. Um, and I'm not saying that they don't think about composition. They absolutely do. But, um, you know, just getting back to the photograph for a moment, like uh, in all my workshops, when they come in with photographs, and this is the same thing that I do, they always come with a photograph and they say, well, here's the picture I'd like to paint. Even if I am going to change the colors, here's the picture I like to paint. And um, I say, well, you haven't composed it yet. And they go, well, what do you mean? It's like, I take them to this exercise where they have to, well, classic, they have to crop it. But they have to crop it in three different ways and come up with three entirely different compositions from the same subject. And this is like a very basic practice, but it's often a revelation to people because yeah. they didn't realize that all those secrets 
were buried in, in, in their photo. So that's another way that the photo, uh, you know, kind of lies to us. Um, and that, that's a good way for somebody to, to come up with some, you know, first of all, to, to learn by looking at different croppings, you know, but often taking less provides us with more. It's actually called limited focus. We, we narrow the focus. Uh, we, we, we limit the amount that we're including in our picture, but what we're actually doing is heightening the focus. So it's one of those limitations that we impose on ourselves that actually yeah. improves our artwork. Limited focus, but yes. I mean, the whole idea that, you know, less is more, and I know that th this is a perfect segue into like one of the, I mean, you're a colorist, really. You know, I mean, that's where you're fallen in love. I can tell looking at your work and you have a thing about like color grouping, right? Yes. And that, that, is, that is similar to what we're talking about in yes. design. It's can very you really, into that a little and help yeah, us? I'll, I'll, color I'll is some, another big bugaboo. I'll have some, some samples here. So for me, I mean, the color grouping is not like, I didn't invent this idea. Um, I mean, it's, it just exists out there and I just sort of kind of put a focus onto it. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I love to do, and you can probably tell that from my work, is that there can be all kinds of, there can be sky, ground, earth, rock. I, I all want it to feel that it's um, incredibly unified. It's bound together by a common color of, of the light. So getting, you know, we could have like 10 different substances in our painting. We can have um, blue skies and green hills, but it all has to feel that it is under the light of that of that yellow sun or the red sun or whatever color the sun is at that particular time. So, but we, whatever we're doing, we want, and I guess this would hold true for abstract as well. We want all the colors, the many colors that make up the color composition, we want them to feel unified, like they're, they belong together. And I'm, I'm putting a wide like parenthesis around that. This can include any kind of painting really, but particularly in landscape, we want the colors to feel harmonious, okay? Right. So in my own work, I found that that was greatly helped um, by having kind of a limited palette. So here's like a little, um, I'll try to hold this up and then we'll put some stills in there. So like here was a, here was a, a subject uh, that came from a much bigger photo, had a whole mountainscape going across. But again, I just kind of zoomed in to a small portion and started to see if I could track the movement between the light patterns of the snow. And it's- is this is a photograph or a, a larger painting? This is a photograph. Of a um, mountain, okay, yeah. And it's, it's cropped, it's, it's cropped to square, even though it was a horizontal. And then um, what I do is in Photoshop, as I said before, I take, um, I take it and I um, shift, it, shift around the colors. So these colors are like, well, yeah, they're made up. I mean, I just sl slid things around. It's, I wanted, to, like I was kind of, it's all blue again, classic blue mountainscape. I had done one. I didn't want to do the same color scheme again. So I just played with the colors until I had this warm light. There's a little bit of blue up in the sky, but a warm light. And then the color grouping part comes in over here. It's, it's pretty small. I'll give you a close up of it. But over here, um, all, essentially all this is is a mini abstract study of the color groups that will appear in the painting. It isn't um, like a list of each individual color, like there might be dozens of colors in the painting, but um, there are individual groups. Uh, I like to use the analogy of um, a color chord, like in music. In music you have, I'm not a musician, but I know that you hit the, you know, a chord on the piano, it's like several notes. They're individual notes, but collectively, they make a chord that, that has a certain harmonic quality. Yeah, yes. Color groups are the same thing in painting. The chord might have three notes, it might have six notes, it could have a dozen notes. But the idea is that those notes are all related to that chord. And then any given painting might have um, two or three chords in it, not in equal amounts. So the color grouping then is a way that I, I often joke, uh, maybe you do something like this too, with students when we get to the color, because color is such a vast topic. I say, you know, my whole reason for doing this, you know, for, for teaching you color grouping or analyzing the palette is color, I want you to think about it. I don't mm -hmm. want you to just 
look at the photo and try to match the colors. So uh, when you look at nature, most of the time, um, things are color grouped. There's a dominant color for the sky. There's a dominant color for the foliage. If it's, if it's sunset or sunrise and there's reddish colors or whatever the colors are, they're not every color under the rainbow. They are, there may be many hundreds of colors, individual little bits of color, but they really fall nicely into these groups. And so you're painting behind you as it's an abstract painting, but it's beautifully color grouped. It's got three color groups in my mind. It's got the, the whitish beige of the backdrop. It's got the gold and it's the blue. That is what it gives the painting a kind of color coherency or cohesiveness, which I think is a very desirable thing in any kind of painting, but it's certainly desirable in landscape. So the color grouping is like a little swatch exercise that, yeah. I, that I do with painters. You know, the, the idea of color coherence or harmony, the reason I think it has more relevance maybe in the kind of work you make is that you are reminding people that this is nature. And in nature, you're right, this happens all the time. We have a sunset and that orange light bathes everything we're looking at and it creates the harmony. And in just painting, 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 we can use harmony if we want to create a painting that feels cohesive or we, we might want to make a painting that doesn't feel cohesive because that's what we right. want to express, you know, but we need to know how to do both for sure. Right. There's, I don't say two kinds of harmony, but this is the kind you're talking about in nature where because of the light, things are very unified, you know, by the, by the global um, color of the sun or the, the atmosphere. So that's one kind of harmony. But I, I know many fantastic um, landscape paintings where there isn't really an atmosphere. It isn't unified by atmosphere, but the colors still relate well and they form a nice, a nice harmony. But I, I think it's, it's, at least in, in the world according to Mitch, I think it's fair to say that um, I think you have a better chance of um, attaining the kind of harmony that you want or avoiding discordant colors. If you think about, you know, what are the main color chords of my painting or groups or color families, if you start out with that, then you're less likely to, you know, go off track and wind up with a painting that's about every color there is and then you kind of you kind of lose a lot when that happens you know we, we think that having lots of bright fantastic right. color all around us is is the answer but actually that's just like too much of a good thing it's it's better in in smaller in smaller doses do you always use the photoshop to uh to to play around that's so interesting um well i so often do but i often um just do studies by um by hand as well yeah um, the traditional way, um, because I'm sort of adept with Photoshop, it's a quick way for me to do it. I mean, usually, uh, I don't want to make it sound like every photograph I work with, I just totally flip it on its head and don't use the colors that are in the photograph at all. Uh -huh. I do, but, but thinking like a painter, I'm evaluating from the outset, well, the sky is too deep and dark blue, and uh, the trees are like too green, um, or, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm finding like, again, back to the business about photographs, you have to ask yourself, um, what are the problems with the color in this photograph? If you don't ask yourself that question, you're probably not gonna come up with any answers, but there's a lot of problems with photographs. You, you know, the, the, they look like postcards sometimes. They're so beautiful, you don't wanna touch them. But a lot of times the colors are overly colorful. Sometimes they're too drab. Yeah, yeah. Accent color, so, um, so I sometimes um, use Photoshop to kind of steer me in a direction, but a lot of times I'll do a, a study by hand um, and, and test things out. I also, I, I, can, uh, I can give you a still shot to use later where I take um, the same subject and I just do like eight or 10 studies, almost making them up of different, um, color lights attached yeah, to Yeah, it. it's like the, it's like Monet's uh, haystack painting. Yeah, but I just do them in little tiny three by five studies, one after yeah. the other. And, um, and it's a really, it's a very intense um, color muscle building exercise. Um, it's, it's a big stretch when I do it in the workshops, 
um, sometimes I call it like 100 studies, but um, it's really um, a fabulous way of getting you to relinquish control over the color in the photograph and be willing to, uh, I don't want to say make up color because it sounds so arbitrary and reckless. Yeah. But I have to say that for as long as I've been working with color, I've always been, on one hand, I've always been bound to reality. But on the other hand, the longer I do it, the more that I think that most of the color I put down in my studio paintings, most of the time is mostly departing from what I actually see. It, it, it has an allegiance to some degree, but if we're painters, we're color inventors and we're never, we don't want to become color copyists. And right. So, so I think it through that way. So, um, so t walk us quickly through the steps that you kind of go to make these pictures. I mean, what materials you're using, how you start. I mean, I think we're talking about how you start. You come up with something, you've got some okay. sketches. Take a, walk us through this, the well, process. The, the you do. first step is, is the idea. And, and that might happen um, while I'm there at the scene. Um, like I've, it happened uh, you know, with waterfalls. I was once on top of Mount Constitution on Orcas Island and it was a foggy morning and the clouds were swirling around. I was like, oh boy, there we go. And I had yeah. an idea. It happened, I was in Alaska once and there was all this fog and all of a sudden you just saw these patches of snow. Well, there was a two year series right out of that. So I get really inspired by something I see. Yeah, in nature, on you take it sounds like you do a lot of trips and hiking. Some and trips, stuff. yeah, some yeah. trips. Um, um, and I find um, I find things in nature. I get inspired. Basically, there's a vision. Okay, and I don't think that's that different than most artists. You know, they they, yeah. them, they see something cool. They want to they want to paint it. For me, the vision's often aligned with something very atmospheric or moody or very abstract. But in any case, I find my vision. Then I have my photos. Now, again, I'm talking about studio painting now. When I'm, when I'm painting yeah. outside, I sort of make a decision right there. I paint the scene and it's, it, I come home and it's done. You know, I might, I don't actually even necessarily take that and turn it into a big uh, painting, which is a very um, uh, routine practice for a lot of paintings, which is, which is fine. For me, the kind of investigation I want to do with composition I have to really spend some time with it. So, so after, after the fact of, of the photograph, I, I, I explore it. So the first phase again would be vision. The second phase would be um, uh, like composition. Um, and that, that I'll work out, um, you know, in part by, uh, I could do it with um, um, hand done sketches. I have, I have a sample I can pull out later and show you some hand done sketches, um, just exploring like, would this be better in a wide format, in a square yeah, format? Yeah, just kind of working on the composition in yeah. sketch form. Yeah, would the, um, would the uh, mountain be better over to the left? Would it be better, better over to the right? An example of that would be um, when I was in Italy, uh, there was this lovely town called Bagnoreggio. And um, it, is, it is the ultimate quintessential hilltop town. Um, here, here's the postcard of the place. Or photograph I took. Uh, not I didn't take this photograph. Wow. Photograph of the place. It's quite beautiful. And I've always been in love with edifices, like just like monumental uh, forms, just like just kind of glowing in front of you. Um, and uh, so I wanted to do a painting of this. And um, but the uh, the composition was very challenging because the horizon line that the top of the hills ran right along the top edge of the of the mountain yeah and, um so i started to um you know again talking about uh, sometimes i'll i'll crop it on the computer but if i need to kind of think outside the box a little bit i might actually um do a series of um thumbnails these were just done with um pen um on paper freehand and you can see I'm playing with square compositions, vertical compositions. Yeah, horizontal, and, and, and definitely also, dark and light patterns. That's exactly right. Yeah. And also, where is the mountain? Is it high, is it low, is it to the left, is it to the right? And I, and I did you know, quite a few of these to find, my, um, to find my way. The other thing that was tricky is just what you talked about, the pattern of light and dark. So ultimately, I did a little, a little study 
that um, this one might show up, but that um, it, it's actually you probably see it better in the in the thumbnails. But it was you know light on the on the right. Then let me see right on the well. It started light, then it went to dark shadow, then it went to light again, and then it went to dark again. So I had to adjust the values to sort of alternate as I moved across the mountain. So, so that's that pacing and spacing thing you're consciously yeah, thinking and about. I'm doing it with patterns. Right. So that worked out that part of it. Then the, the photos I had was sort of a semi overcast day. They weren't that great. So I was looking at what, what um, other kinds of uh, sources were. And I found um, a photograph um, just off the internet that really had the mountain, um, the hilltop mountain, and just really brilliant sun. And so I thought that's really more the direction I wanted to go. But of course, I'm not going to copy that, that color. So I started to do some color studies. And, um, and here, was a, here was a study that, again, you can see the patterns, you can see the colors, and starting to make it, make it my own. And, and only after I'd done all this would I then you know, start um, the larger painting. And so after the color study, I'll move into um, the full size painting. And this painting is not finished, it's just the first initial, um, the first initial um, stage. Um, and you can see that the, the patterning, um, you know, the light, the dark light, dark light alternating as you move from left to right is still there. Um, you can see that the sky is merging with the top of the mountain, and you can make out that the color is very, very similar to that study. It's this kind of goldenish, greenish, yellow light. The whole thing is bathed in it. Did you draw that with like a pencil or? Oh, no. This is this is um, this is um, thin, transparent um, oil paint. Um, there's no because it's an unfinished painting. There's no. Um, opacity to the paint yet right so just sort of thin washes that are kind of scrubbed on done, you know done with a bold brush this is oil paint this is what's called an underpainting yeah um, yeah and, and did you use pencil first to get the proportions or you just kind of look at your sketch and just do no, it i just kind of look at well no if it's a complicated um subject i will do a little bit of a grid but i've had um complicated um i mean i've done i've done all all of them i've done freehanding it I've done gridding it. Um, I've taken um, a gigantic enlargement of the subject and then transferred it. I mean, right. whatever, whatever it takes, you know, but generally I, I guess I favor the doing it freehand because again, if I'm doing it freehand, I'm sort of having a relationship with the shapes as I do it. Yeah, and yeah. I'll, whereas if I'm just tracing it or something, that's like saying, well, this is already decided. And I, I need to leave room for for me to 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 make changes, and 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 I do make changes. It's also at a bigger scale, you know, doing yeah, painting yeah, this totally painting different. Changes it, so you step back and you go, oh wow, you know, that looked okay in my in my study, but I really need to make that area bigger or lighter or wider. And, and I noticed that you're putting a little bit of value contrast when you start, um, because you're trying to you those patterns of light and dark are important. Is it is it Accurate to say that then you, as you keep going, you darken and get the more paint more op opaque. And are you mixing complementaries okay. for those colors? Um, again, I'll have a color scheme worked out, but um, getting um, like bumping up the contrasts um, is in that painting is probably not something I'm going to do because one of the one of the qualities of my work is like very rarely will you see a rich deep dark. I, yeah. I, I sort of borrow from the Impressionist tr tradition where you keep the shadows and the lights closer to the mid-range, which allows the colors to kind of reveal more of their innate saturation. And so um, the shadows might get a little darker in that uh, Wagner Reggio painting, but they wouldn't get much darker because um, I'm going to play with, you know, the colors kind of vibrating and they, they do that more nicely when they're, closer in value. This one, the value um, contrasts are just like one degree. They're very, very narrow. I love it. I love but, it. 
but the color relationships, the vibration between the colors, the cool and the warm, um, becomes what it's all about. Right, and, right. Uh, and I, and th this series from a few years back is among my, my favorite series of all time because I felt like I was pushing the edge of the envelope, not just with abstraction, but I was using the color and the atmosphere to support that abstraction. I mean, everybody looks at it and knows it's a mountain, but you know, I, my, my goal is I want to make them feel that they need to put their sunglasses on when they, when they look at it. Those were challenging because they don't have the tradition. Well, they do have the traditional, I was about to say they don't have the traditional value, darks and lights, but you know what? They do, except instead of the darks and lights being way apart, they're just right here. And it's a lot, it's a lot subtler, but it's kind of a magical quality that I, that I, that I, that I love exploring and I, and I, and I want to explore more for sure. Yeah. And, and let me say that it's also, it's pretty hard to pull off, you know, um, it's, I always have a, you know, one of the challenges I see with people learning is that their, uh, their, their, their values tend to head towards mid value just because they're not paying attention. And then it gets really hard to see what's actually happening because it's so subtle, you know, but you're, you're ex living in that. Uh, are you familiar with Russell Chatham, the landscape? Oh, yeah. 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 So, you know, I knew you would, but, you know, his, he's the same animal as you, you know, and it's, yeah. they're so subtle, even more subtle in real life than because when they take a photograph of a painting, the contrast comes up. And these things are so subtle. And, yeah. uh, but, but boy, it really, there's an emotional content that comes with that and the yeah, color and the I, mood. I think I recognize that people are very attracted to strong, bold contrasts, and that I might lose some some fans when I do that. But you know, you gotta you gotta paint who you are, you know. Yeah. So I'm curious, you know, because I don't get to talk to a lot of people that are so developed artistically, and and they've also so developed in their teaching and their writing. For you, what is the biggest challenge that you you tend to help people with, and and, and what is it, and what's the answer to it? Okay, um, well, um, in all my teaching, um, I, I tend to keep it around um, the big three, composition um, being one of them, and um, also a lot about uh, color. And then the other thing specifically with landscape, and probably the most important thing, is simplification. How do you take all that complexity and yes. into something that's uh, not going to be uh, a visual assault on the eye with all its with its with its <laughs> detail. So everything falls into those three um, categories. And as, as I said before, I think composition is the one that we probably spend uh, well. Composition and color we spend a lot on. What I hope I do is that I I train people to ask questions. I mean, I I literally say this in every workshop. I say the only difference between me and you is not that I'm like some kind of artistic genius. Um, I've been painting a little longer, yes, but what those years have given me is an ability to ask certain questions, right? So like a composition. If I don't ask the question, am I having two similar sized shapes? I might wind up using two similar sized shapes. But if yeah. I ask the questions, so I give them questions. I, I say, so ask yourself the questions. And, and the beautiful thing about composition, it's not always the same this with color, but with composition, if you ask the question, is chocolate better than vanilla, you always get the right answer. And of course, the right answer is chocolate. But in any case, <laughs> um, and, and they experience, them, experience it themselves. I mean, if you give them the raw material to think about, because composition is very innate. You can teach it. You can teach the principles. But you're really teaching them just like, look over here, uh -huh. notice this, and which is better. Nine out of 10 people will say, this is better. Yeah. Do you have a list of questions uh, that, you, that you share? Yeah, I could, I could get them together for you. I would love that because I would love to see it because I do. And yeah. I think for sure people listening would, that would be very- Especially cool. about, about okay. composition. Yeah, so- um, Yeah, you know, for sure. For asking sure. about- the things that I focus on in the, in the teaching. Yes. Um, one of the things that also happens um, is it's, and I don't mean this 
uh, facetiously um, is that I actually, by teaching this stuff, I actually get better myself. Oh yeah. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. It's like my shape, uh, my attention to shapes is better. Um, my, uh, the way I work with color and using the color grouping and thinking about harmony, it, it's, it's more focused now than it was before. I mean, if, if, if there was anything bad I could say about it is that I, because I'm constantly writing about it and teaching about it and organizing all this thought so people can understand it, I tend to like sometimes overthink it in my own work. Oh yeah. That can be a, that can be a problem, you know, just yeah. too over. And that's why you, you, you connect with other artists and have them give you the proverbial smack on the Absolutely. side of the head, and say, you know, which I find invaluable. So another piece of advice, don't work in a vacuum, man. Just Yeah, you know, absolutely. And have a community of people that are around you that that you can underst that understand the language, that can give you feedback, even if it's just from a completely different perspective, it'll yeah. allow you to see things in a new and different way. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And so, you're, you're uh, a teacher slash artist, artist slash teacher as, as I am, can you, uh, if someone's interested in pursuing this, what advice would you give them? Um, oh. I mean, it's worked uh, for me, but I hear from a lot of artists like, no way, man. I, it would just, it would take me down. And that hasn't been my experience. But well, it hasn't been mine either. But I think, I don't think everybody is necessarily uh, cut out to, to yeah. be a teacher or an instructor. I mean, if it's not, some of the best painters I know don't teach, and that's fine. Um, but if somebody is interested in teaching, um, I think that there is a, um, a talent to it um, that's more than um, just being a competent artist uh, on your own. Oh, yeah. I think that for me, it, it boils down to two things, and you probably agree with me, is that one is you have to be able to take kind of abstract or difficult to understand ideas and spell them out in a way that they can understand and implement without completely flopping at it you know you have to like i, I spent a lot of yeah. sweat over when i'm developing an exercise for a workshop it's like you know yeah i can give them something that i can do easily now but would be really impossible for them that's not going to do anybody very good you have to set set the exercises up in a way that they can they can achieve some success with it so yes yes so have to be able to know how to translate those complex things into uh into bite-sized ideas that they can understand and actually implement and then the second part of it is just you get as an instructor you get to practice being a better human being because you have to lead with kindness not that i'm not that i don't lead with kindness elsewhere in my life but in teaching yeah. it's like lead with kindness um uh, mitch wow i love that you know and i think it's a i think kindness slash generosity yeah. slash transparency slash you know humility is a big one yeah, it's the it's, nicest thing i do in my life yeah 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 and, and uh, you know, you teach workshops everywhere and everything can be found, by the way, and we'll provide links, you guys, yeah. uh, on your website, um, MitchAlbala.com. You've got workshops. Yeah. We haven't yeah. even talked about your books, which you, yeah. you hold like the, I was blown away with like m the most popular landscape painting book ever, right? I mean. Well, I don't know about ever, but it's certainly been for the last 10 years. Um, well, yeah, that's pretty, yeah. it's rating on Amazon. Yeah, and we'll yeah. provide links to that for people to, to get it. Yeah. Um, um, that's a tremendous. Yeah, I'm very, very excited about that. And I get, I hear from readers all the time. And uh, sometimes I, I was watching an art video. Um, I don't know what it was. This may be some of the pastel artists or watercolor artists. And they were just talking about what they were doing. And there in the background, sitting on the table was my book. You know, they oh, weren't very talking about it, but it was nice to see. And sometimes people will, uh, shoot me um, emails from from Scotland or some foreign land and say, oh, look, I just saw your book in the museum bookstore, which I always get a kick out of. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, one thing that we share, I think, in reading, you know, and reading your interviews and everything, you're, you're really, uh, you know, articulate and, and, and talk a lot about uh, authenticity and finding your point of view and oh yeah and, and and all that and i explain it in certain ways i'm curious how do you how do you talk about that um and to for, for well, people it's um, a big one you know everyone's like what's my style who am i what am i doing yeah, and, um i um i do talk about cultivating a style with people 
Um, for me, um, when I, the way I get to that with students is what I, what I mentioned earlier, I ask them, you know, what is their painting about? Like when we start a workshop, we're going to be together for, for several weeks or several days. I ask them, you know, what is your work about? And I give them the business about no, no nouns, only adjectives and verbs. And if I can steer them toward um, the aesthetic aspect of art making, then they're going to get closer to being, uh, to, to, to finding their voice. But I also know that the voice is some, sometimes takes time to emerge, but I could contradict that by saying that I get students that they come in, I can tell right away within the first hour, which ones are going to be the painterly painters, which ones are going to be the type painters, which ones are going to be the expressive colorists and which ones are going to be more muted with their color. Um, we have, I, 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 I can't prove it to you, but I know it's true. We have these, just as you have a personality and I have a personality and they're distinct and different, we have artistic personalities. And um, before you even pick up a brush or take your first class, you have one. It's in there. And when you take your, your classes and workshops, that starts to emerge. And there is no suppressing it or repressing it. Um, I, I like to say that um, for me, it stemmed, it stemmed as a, a, a kind of a spiritual thing for myself, uh, paint who you are. Because one of, the, one of the hazards I run into, because I teach so much and I look at so much artwork and I see so much fantastic stuff that makes me go, oh, I just like, I, like, I, I love broken color. But I really don't use it much in my own work, right? So I see the broken color, and somebody else is working, I go, oh my God, I want to do that. Or I when you say broken color, what, what do you mean oh, exactly? I mean like um, having, um, um, rather than, you know, flat. Unrelated color. Rather than having flat areas of shape, you would have um, different pieces of color juxtaposed next to each other. I think the term came into popularity when the, from the Impressionists, because they might have like, um, like in one of my skies, it might have a, sort of a cool yellow, but juxtaposed next to that is a very cool blue of the same value. So oh, we, I see, like, yeah. You know, like pastel artists. Yeah. Who I love Think of like Monet water lily paintings, right? It's close yeah. value, yeah. vibrating. Yeah, pastels, lots of, bro I, I, lots of broken color. And I love broken color, but I don't always do it so readily. So I'll look around, I'll see it, or I'll look at a painter going, I don't know, it could be anything that, that I think is fantastic. And I, I basically start to tell myself, oh, you should paint that way. And, and maybe I'll try and experiment or I'll, I want to do this in this painting because I want to be like that painter or something. And you know what? It never, ever works. Yeah. Um, I, I, and so I say, you know, it's not that I don't take inspiration from it, but I have to, I have to paint who you are. It's just it's the exact same expression as, be who you are, you know, be true to yourself. It's the same thing, but applied to your art. Just paint who you are. And the fact is, you can't help it. You, you, you have to. You really don't have any other choice. What I what was challenging, though, if I can flash back to just sort of more in the beginning stages of this whole art creative journey, what if you don't know? What if you what, don't know? What if I don't know? Are? Why would you know who you are creatively? And how, how, what is the fast route to, to getting that going? Um, I don't know that I have a, a, a definitive answer for that, except that um, look at what you like, right. look at what you do, and that's a clue. Like related to this, um, when people talk about influences, right? Um, I always like to turn that a little bit, 90 degrees. And so like, if, like I've always, um, like, oh, I don't know, I'm thinking of an art artist. Yeah, like, the, there's an artist, Edouard Vuillard. He was a post-impressionist. Yeah. Vuillard, yes. Um, not a landscape painter. He painted um, interiors. Those are crazy interiors. Yeah, crazy. I love those. I love it. So he's among my favorite painters of all time. And I, I've, I've loved him since I was in college. So now, I don't paint like Vuillard. But it's only in the last couple of years, I'm starting to realize, what is it that I loved about Vuillard? It was the pattern. I yeah. love yeah. abstract patterning, and, and he's totally about that. And so now, is it that I saw the Vuillards and um, patterning 
was awakened to me and from that day forward I started loving pattern or is it that my artistic personality already loved pattern and my love for his paintings was a clue to that yes yes, See, yes. in other words I think we have this stuff in us so if somebody's struggling well, I don't know what my voice is I don't know what, I, what my style is look to what you love look to what you produce now sometimes yeah. that's difficult but I think the answers are there because it's like you have a personality you have a you have an artistic personality. absolutely I mean I think mining the work that you've done and this is what I say to a lot of people is like there look at the last 20 things you've made Mm -hmm. And there's one of those that's going to have some energy for you and try to look even at part of it. Like, what is it about that part that I, there's something I love there. You know, we all intuitively can feel what we love, but then after a while by keeping on looking at it, but really it's about looking at the journey and the arc of our work that gives us information that allows us to become more and more authentic and more and more true to ourselves. So I agree. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's there. It's, it's, it's a little, it's, it's like, you know, you have to learn to draw, you have to learn how to mix color. You have to learn these, um, these techniques to paint, but the artistic personality, it's more like that has to just kind of be exposed. Yes. Right? Yes. 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 Um, Circling back real quick, because I, I was curious, your paintings have this luminosity to them, and are they on canvas in oil paint? Is it? Um, some of them are. Actually, most of the recent work um, from the Azure and Asphalt series, I'll show you an example of that series. Um, and, and this one, this one does have some luminosity. Well, first of all, are they on canvas or, or panel? And then how are you finishing them? What are you using? I mean, you're using oil paint. What medium are you using? And how are you finishing them to create that luminosity that you're right. getting? Most of the um, paintings in the last uh, three or four years have been on uh, panel or, or paper. I love working on gesso paper wow. because uh, the paper has a texture to it. And I love it when the... Um, the surface kind of speaks back to you. So panel, just a paper, but, I, but larger pieces have also been done on canvas. And um, I think I prefer panel um, best of all. I don't know, I don't know why. I think partly because I put it, I, I, I just so a texture into it, uh -huh. prepare the panel. And then again, that, that speaks back to me and it's a hard surface so I could kind of sand it or scrub it or do whatever I, yeah. I need to do it. Um, and then you asked me about the luminosity. Yeah, and just, and well, like the glaze, do you use glazes, right. do you use finishes? Yeah, so I would say that um, I'm mostly, uh, mostly an opaque painter, meaning I just put spots of opaque color, but I do work over certain areas, and maybe there's some, maybe 25% of glazing going on. I mean, I'm not a glaze painter in the classical sense. Right. Higher painting is built up in multiple transparent layers. I mean, sometimes I'm, most of the time I'm working opaquely, but then when I'm putting a new color down, I might put that color down a little transparently or rub it back a little bit um, so I can get some of the other color beneath to show through, which is, which is a form of a, of a glaze. Yes, yes, um, yes. Yeah. And then the, the finished coat, how do you, how do you, if you're shipping these to a gallery, how do you, what's kind of uh, surface? Well, you like I varnish it? them. I varnish them. Um, I use a varnish called Gamvar. And oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. What's it's, that like? It's great. Um, it's a, it's, I mean, I could give a whole pitch for it, but um, um, there's a, there's a, there's an article about it on my website. Just search on Gamvar, G-A-M-V-A-R. Um, it's by Gamblin. It's very easy to apply. And um, you don't have to wait, you know, that six months or a year in order for it to, to uh, for the paint to, to, to dry so thoroughly that you're allowed to varnish it, which means you can varnish something, you know, that's only been, you know, uh, cooked for about, you know, a few weeks or a month or two. That yeah, sense. I see. And, and what medium are you using to mix with your oil paint as your I just use a, um, a traditional... Um, uh, alkyd based painting medium called uh, Daniel Smith's painting medium for alkyds and oils. Oh, wow. 
But uh, gamblin also makes a, a nice medium a solvent free gel. Um, so, you know, I use those um, and uh, nothing too formulaic or, or right, right. Well, there's just that luminosity is such an important part of your work. Well, the luminosity, um, I, th I, I think I see where you were getting at with the question about the glazing and the luminosity. I think that the, the, um, the luminosity that you're talking about um, is, it has to be partly about the, the layers, I would suppose, it, and the glazing. The color relationships. It's yeah. mostly about, um, you know, the, the color relationships. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the way I get them to vibrate and the way that I bring the values a little closer, which yeah. allows the colors to dance and vibrate a little, a little more. Yes. It's mostly yeah. about the color. I mean, I think it's, I mean, look at the impressionists. I mean, they were not glaze painters by any stretch of the imagination, and yet their works are among the most luminous of all time. So you can get luminosity through through glazing, through opaque paint, and or through some combination of the two. Right, time. right, right. So, um, so just you know, in closing, yeah. where are you headed, and what what are you excited about uh, coming up next for you? I mean, you just do so much, but is it? Yeah, I'm just curious. Well, um, I'm actually, I think I'm coming close to the end of the series that I've been working on for a couple of years called Azure and Asphalt. There's a portfolio of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that right now. You, you do a lot in a series, by the way. Yes, the, I sort of like like to take after Monet. I do a, a same, same subject, but uh, in lots of different lights with slightly different compositions. You can see some of them um, floating behind me. Yeah, but you also, yeah, the compositions are kind of similar. I mean, not totally, but you know. one. Um, and this one has that luminous quality. And um, if you look at it really closely, I'll give you a detail. You can see little bit, this is the broken color we talked about, little strokes of pale, pale, warm blue against little strokes of pale, pale yellow. And the two together give it a little bit of a, of a dance and a vibration that would be more interesting than if this were just, you know, a yellow. Oh, absolutely. This is another one from the series. That very, very um, limited palette. And again, you're hopefully you're kind of hit with an impression of color and maybe pattern. Uh huh. And, and that it's a street and a river. Yes. And I think it's that order. Exactly. It's the, yeah, it's the order. I, I like I like a painting. I like to sort of manipulate the order in which you perceive aspects yes, of, yes. of, of the, the hierarchy. So, yeah. so this series is kind of wrapping up. And so what, what's coming next? Well, um, I'm looking, uh, getting back to what I said earlier about broken color. I, because these were urban landscapes, um, I tended to um, have to get tighter than I, than I wanted to. Or yes. like a height by accident, like the one I just showed you, the blue one, that wasn't tight. But some of the other ones got a little tight and I could do it. I had to, it was, it was challenging because I had to um, find a balance. Uh, this one will be an example of that. Um, like you, you can tell me when you look at this, I mean, I think that the first thing you see is color and pattern. Yes. A little more detailed than the other pieces. And, um, but it was it was a real juggling act because I had to put the detail in because it was sort of required as as an urban landscape. But I had I had to back off on it enough so that you would still capture the things that I was interested in you capturing. You know, yes. the patterns and the abstraction. So anyway, this series had a lot of these atmospheric. Uh, moody uh, scenes and then it also had a lot of some of these more detailed uh, paintings and I'd like to get back to a subject that where I can not solar urban landscape where I can kind of let go of some of those those harder edges yeah and um, I've always been drawn to um, the mountains and I have a series of paintings you know abstract patterns of um, snow and stuff here's one of them right again it's clearly a mountain I don't think we take any anyone very long to register that, but it's also very much about about the uh, about the patterns, and yeah. so I'm, I'm drawn to that, and so I may I may go back to that, and I'm also um, this is an interesting question because it's literally what I'm starting to think uh -huh. about. Yeah, well, um, I can, I, you know, I, I can feel the energy that you've yeah. got for this. You know? Yeah, and I'm also thinking about the color field stuff. Like I don't I know that, that I'm I'm gonna. 
I, I don't know, who knows? Um, I may go fully abstract, but I think I'll always have a foothold in, in reality. But to think about paintings that just are like, you know, 95% uh. atmosphere and color feel and just with the tiniest, just one toe of two I feet. I love it, I love in, that. In the, in, the, uh, in the representational world. Yeah. I think that's probably closest uh, to my heart. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I think so. That sounds that sounds right. And I think generally, you know, we go from a we go more expansive that way. You know, like paintings generally as we develop. And I'm not saying this is necessarily always the case, but it makes sense to me looking at all the work you've made, like where what you're describing, why it would become yeah. bigger and more spiritual and just more expansive as you have become a bigger human being. You know. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes that takes a little, a little. It's a little scary, as you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a good way. To, you have to be in willing to, to have some failures in there, which is yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. We were always like the student, and I think that's a, a, a really great component of being a great teacher is to, to remind students that you know where you are right now is like, it's the sweet spot. It's so great to learn new stuff, yeah. and you, know, you think you got to figure this all out, but once you do you're still gonna be figuring out stuff. You know, yeah. you, you're speaking about vulnerability and fear and you've been painting your whole yeah. life and you know. Yeah, you could, there should be a workshop on like artists dealing with the vulnerability, the fear, the ego, oh, yeah. such a big part of it. And uh, I really admire painters who have this fearless experimental quality to them. You just ask them a question, they go, oh yeah, that's interesting. And boom, they'll just go off and do it. It's yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, Mitch, thank you so much for all this time welcome. and really all the information. Really, really great. And okay. again, uh, everything you guys is available on, uh, you know, MitchAlbala's.com. Uh, MitchAlbala. Workshops. Uh, you know, we'll put separate links here for the book. And, um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, anything in closing you want to just uh, let people know before we no, hop? I'm just glad to be able to talk about all this with you. And I really appreciate you asking me to do it. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Okay, okay. we'll, uh, we'll be in touch.